We are going to start with the plan of salvation and we're going to change it up a little bit because as we are waiting for the soon return of Jesus, we want to make sure first and foremost that we know Jesus ourselves. Uh, you can't save other people that are drowning if you're drowning. So we want to make sure that we know Jesus for ourselves, And then we want to make sure that we know how to communicate salvation with other people because as long as we are still here, as long as we're still here waiting for the rapture, our number one objective, our purpose is the Great Commission. Our purpose is to tell other people about Jesus, to tell other people that there is salvation. And salvation is very simple. The good news, gospel simply means the good news. And the good news is that God came and put on humanity. You know, right here, who is Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh. It's very important what Jesus. There are lots of false Jesuses today. Just because someone says that they're following Jesus does not mean that they're following the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible is God. God came and put on humanity and he paid the price for us. Jesus died for us. He died for sinners. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. Jesus is God. He was born of a virgin. He did not inherit sin. Mary, Mary was not perfect. Mary's a human. Jesus is perfect because of God, not because of Mary. That's a, that's a false belief in Catholicism. Jesus was completely sinless. He who knew no sin, remember God made him to be sin. He, he put all the sin on the wor of the world on him. He took our sin and we received his righteousness. So he that knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ Jesus. We are now righteous, not because of anything that we do, but completely because of Jesus. And we are righteous as soon as we receive him as our savior. And there's nothing that we do to add to our righteousness. We don't do good deeds in order to stay saved or be saved. We do good deeds because when you love someone, you want to please them. And so good deeds are a natural outcome of someone who has received Jesus as their savior and love him. You want to please him. It has nothing to do with salvation other than it's a natural outpouring of what happens when you receive Jesus's righteousness. And so how are we saved? We realize that we're a sinner. We realize that we cannot be good enough. We realize that good works do not save us. And we put our trust, we believe on Jesus, not just that he was, not just that he is God, but we are putting our trust in him, that him alone and what he did on the cross is enough for our salvation. We are trusting him completely with our salvation. And so that is salvation. So today we're going to look at the dispensations of the Bible. We're going to look at how right now we are living in a time between dispensations. We are living at the very tail end of the church age. And we're watching the 70th week of Daniel. We're watching Jacob's trouble. We're watching the tribulation come into focus. And so because of this, we're still in the time of grace. We're still in the time of the Gentiles, but we can see the seven year tribulation just right, right on the cusp, you know, right on the horizon we can see the tribulation. And because of that, we're living in this time right here, right in between the rapture and the tribulation period. We're living right on the edge there. So right now we're only in the second week of 2024. And this year has already been proclaimed to be the year for huge advancements toward the tribulation. This is gonna be the year of war. This is going to be the year of financial collapse, they're saying. This is going to be the year of huge movements toward a global world system. Uh, this fall, the summit for the future, 
you know, this is the, the UN, the, um, the WHO, the World Economic Forum, the world government is prime and is ready for the tribulation period. So this is mainly in wars. We're gonna see Israel, also World War Three is, I think what's going on right now with Israel and the regional war is gonna spark off World War Three. Uh, technology, just what we saw last year alone in 2023, um, the way OI, the way AI has taken over to where it's, it's, it's incredible what it's done in such a short period of time. And they're saying by the end of 2024, they expect that most of the news will actually be written by AI. And so just imagine some problems that are gonna come up with that. Um, and they're, they're warning of a worldwide financial collapse, not just the dollar with BRICS and, and all of that, but worldwide this domino effect that is necessary in order to bring in the CBDCs, to bring in the, um, the central bank digital currency and to bring in that currency that is necessary for the tribulation period and, and the mark of the beast. So we can also expect this year worldwide consolidate, consolation, consolidate, uh, consolation of power. So as a result of this war, as a resort, as a result of the diseases, um, economic challenges, all these things are going to give this worldwide, um, the worldwide beast system, this government system, it's going to give them more power. So already we've lost a lot of, of a lot of rights that people don't even realize. They have forfeited rights because of fear. We talked about that a lot last uh, last week, but um, a lot of the rights that we have have been forfeited because of fear, because of the greater good. So. Uh, also worldwide natural disasters. Um, even today, this morning uh, here, uh, you know, in Georgia, but I know there have been snowstorms throughout a lot of the, um, the United States and we had flooding this morning. And so there's been um, earthquakes already. There's been large earthquakes just in the last few days and the beginning of the year, huge earthquakes all over the world. And so we're gonna see these worldwide natural disasters. And of course, Israel is gonna to continue to be positioned for her final seven years. The red heifers are in place. Israel is continuing to be positioned for Jacob's trouble and Daniel's 70, that last seven years of Daniel's 70 years. So this doesn't surprise us because Jesus called these times birth pains. And it should not surprise us that birth pains are getting closer together and more severe as we near the rapture. So as time goes on, these birth pains are going to continue to be closer together and more severe. We keep talking about that and, and, and we call even the, the new term polycrisis, that these crises are on top of each other. They're closer together and they're getting more outrageous. And as a result of that, people are in order to survive, because you really, you can't stay in a hyper sense of trauma. You can't do that. Um, it, it's people cope in order to survive. And uh, now as, as us, we're watching, so we're watching these things, but the way that we cope is we're not fearful because we know these things mean that Jesus is closer. We see these things and we see them in a hopeful way. Um, it's, it's bittersweet, of course, because we're seeing horrible things happen. So we mourn for those that are mourning. We, we mourn at the world. We, we're heartbroken seeing how evil this world is becoming and continuing to see how things are just more outrageous every day. We're, we're not shocked by the things that we see. Um, but at the same time, we don't have the fear that the world has, and we don't have the sorrow that the world has, and we don't need to, we don't need to try to have coping mechanisms like the world has, because our hope is in Jesus, and we know we're going home soon, so we can see these things and not freak out, but the rest of the world, they need coping mechanisms, they need drugs, they need to put their head in the sand, 
they need to just ignore things and not pay attention. And so, so that's, that's what we see. So what do we expect the last moments to look like? You know, we we're watching the Bible actually materialize right in front of our eyes. We're watching what God said would happen, happen right before our eyes. So the Bible gives us a vivid picture of what the world's going to look like at the end of the age. And we're there. We're at the end of the age. We're at the end of the age of the Gentiles. There is more written about the days that we're in and that we're racing toward. There's more written about Jesus' return, the tribulation period beforehand, and the day of the Lord. There's more written about this time than any other time in the Bible. We are literally living in the Bible. Now that should encourage believers because we're seeing just how real and just how true God's word is. Israel is should be a huge testament for all of us at how true God's word is, that Israel is alive today and that the whole world is turning against her is, is just more evidence that the Bible's true, that what God said would happen is exactly happening. And we know that no matter what happens, Israel will be protected. Now she's in, in the day, in the days, months, years ahead through the tribulation, it is called Jacob's trouble for a reason. And so I don't want you guys to miss this right here because the IDF commando, he said, it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And he's, he's right. They are on the cusp of actually going into the real Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Jacob's trouble is that final week of Daniel's 70th weeks. It's the tribulation week. But like Jeremiah says, they will be saved out of it. They will be saved as a result of Jacob's trouble. But here, this is very prophetic that we can see this, that they see this. They are turning back to God. And so now is the time to wake up. Now's the time. Do not go back to sleep. Stay awake, stay alert, stay sober, because Jesus is coming back. So we're living in very biblical times. We're living between these two dispensations, the church age, the age of grace, is closing fast and the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation is setting up right before our eyes. We're seeing the very things set up that are going to find their fulfillment in the years ahead. So this current dispensation of grace is gonna continue until we're raptured, until Jesus, re Jesus removes the restrainer where the, rest the Holy Spirit in us is the restraining force and until he moves us out of the way. And so there was even an article this week, and I may have it signed in here. I can't remember if I do or not, but um, saying how the elite know that Christians are restraining their plans. And that's absolutely true. You know, the enemy can't fully go into what he wants to do as long as we're here. And so here, what are, we, what are we seeing? We're seeing these wars and World War III, and this is from World War III info. Um, we're seeing these wars right on the brink. And this is really significant because all of these things, the U United States is being pulled into. And as a result of that, these are making way for a, another world war that is, is really gonna be central with Israel. Israel is going to have a huge part in this. So North Korea and South Korea, of course, we've seen a lot happen just in the first of the year. Um, just this week, North Korea firing into South Korea, and they have an election going on. And depending on the, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, that's China and Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, they have an election going on. And depending on the winner of Taiwan, if it is a pro-China or um, if, it, if it's a pro-China winner, then we could see how that, um, how that would end up um, Taiwan actually coming underneath China even more. If it's not, it, if it is against China, then there, uh, the experts are saying that there could be war 
with China and Taiwan. So we have North Korea and South Korea. North Korea has been firing at South Korea this week. We of course have Hezbollah versus Israel. Israel has um, killed numerous high up leaders in Hamas and Hezbollah this week. And so this is very interesting. Israel's going directly for the head of the snake. And they are taking out, they're taking out family members of the, they're taking out the brother-in-law. Like for instance, they took out the brother-in-law of Nasrallah. So they are taking out very high up leaders. And if there isn't a profound reaction, then Hezbollah, for instance, is, is, is going to lose face. And so we see this advancement. And also Israel is dealing with America, unfortunately, twisting her arm and trying to get her to, uh, to back down on these things, which of course is not good. You know, America, uh, you know, as someone living in America, this is very concerning because we're no longer really on Israel's side. We're actually being more harmful to Israel now than helpful. And that's always a scary place to be because Israel is the apple of God's eye. And there is judgment coming to any nation that harms Israel and that curses Israel. So then you have the Houthis versus the U.S. and, and really versus a whole alliance. Um, they're in the Red Sea and they are they are. Um, coming against trade and causing everything to be more expensive. And Iran, of course, is, is um, behind a lot of these things. So this would mean that the U.S. would be involved in all of these war scenarios. Easily could result in World War III. And really, the United States is being spread too thin to do all these things. And of course, at home, our borders are wide open and we're very, we're, we're seeing as being very weak right now. One of the consequences between Hezbollah and Israel is this increased alliance between Moscow and Hezbollah. So we've seen this more and more how um, weapons are being uh, provided from Moscow and we see how that is, is putting Syria and Damascus on high alert. You know, we're seeing Damascus get hit. And we know one day, Isaiah 17, one day Damascus will be destroyed. We'll wake up one morning and Damascus will be completely destroyed. And it could very well be because of these weapons that are coming in. And so the U.S. has to support Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, so this means North Korea is going to be firing on the, the U.S. West Coast too. So we see all these places are putting U.S. in in very fragile play and, and we're spread too thin. So, so here we see all these things are mounting, all these scenarios, and everything is on edge. You know, every day it's something big could pop off. So here the escalation of the Middle East has already begun. Israel has on all sides, she's being hit. And that's gonna, that's gonna continue. God is gonna step in to protect Israel in a very supernatural way. And he's already doing that. There's already supernatural ways that God has been protecting her. And missiles that are supposed to go into Israel are instead falling into enemy territory. And uh, so God, God is so good and he's got her, but we must continue to pray for Israel because Jacob's trouble is called Jacob's trouble for a reason. The years ahead are going to be very difficult for Israel. So here, you know, this is going to be a year of shaking loose everything. And so, you know, part of that is God's mercy. He wants people to wake up out of their slumber. He wants people to stop holding on to um, some other safety blanket. He wants people to stop thinking that they can hold on to a political leader that's going to fix it. You know, the only political leader that's going to come in and rescue the day is the Antichrist. That's the only polit political leader that's going to do that. And right now we see the world stage set up for just a man. People on both sides of the aisle, um, globally, everywhere. This isn't just the United States. Everywhere. 
people want a man to come in and rescue them. They don't want Jesus. They want a man to come in and rescue them. And that's exactly what they're going to get. And so we see this already forming. People want a man to come in and save them. And so this is not just, you know, here, since we're in America, or I'm in America, and people watch that are in other, other nations, but, um, you know, this is a big year in America for elections. But it's not just America. There are 64 countries that have scheduled or expected elections this year. Now, many of in America, there's a lot of talk that we our elections won't even happen. And so here, this is what, this is a lot of power that could possibly be shifted this year. Now, notice the enemy, they're all about trying to take advantage of this to have their players in place. And, and no, they've got it all. <laughs> it's all theater. They, the enemy has, has their players in place and know what they're doing. So right now we've got BRICS too, just the first of the year. Now there are 10 nations with the BRICS economy here. And so they of course want to move the dollar out and, and all of this, you know, the economies are going to end up crashing in order to problem reaction solution, usher in the problem. We have to have help. The world economies are crumbling. We have this CBDC. We have this currency that can come in and rescue everybody. And so we, we see the workings of all of that. And of course, the natural disasters, earthquakes already um, this week have in multiple places. And of course, any time when the rapture is on minds and they continue to keep the uh, one of the lies ready to go. So secret UFO meeting prompts speculation over what the government is hiding. So they got to keep the UFOs in kind of the peripheral because when the rapture does happen, that is going to be one of the lies is gonna be that the aliens took us. And so they have that ready. They're, they're getting people more and more used to uh, the, that narrative of UFOs. And then here, of course, the, this US economy, the US economist has just warned that 2024 will bring the biggest crash of our lifetime, predicting a shocking 86% drop of the S&P 500. And, and so here, there's going to be no place to hide. We know that. And, and we've seen, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the rich building these bunkers. Um, and I think it's very interesting because that's very biblical. God told us that the rich, and not just the rich, but that, that everybody, or not everybody, but there would be um, a mix of people that would be going into the mountains going into the rocks and asking them to hide them from Jesus when he comes. And so they know that something's coming and they're, you know, they're, they're getting ready for that, but none of that is going to save them. And the Bible said that's exactly what would happen. So again, we're just having that confirmation and seeing uh, what the Bible said is plain right before our eyes. And so tonight we're going to look at this dispensations and understanding dispensations does help us understand the Bible in general, because it's very important to understand that the Bible is his story. It's Jesus's story. It's God's story. You know, um, in the Western world and in, in Western Christianity, we have done a great injustice in trying to make the Bible about us, trying to make the Bible a self-help book. We have completely missed it altogether because the Bible is not about us. It's not about um, instructions for how we are to live. Those are in there, but that's not the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is for us to know our God, 
to seek him out. He wants to be seeked out. When we approach the Bible as a way of seeking us ourselves out, that's missing it. And we do that. that that's a majority of the majority of the Bible studies out there is how to use the Bible to seek yourself out. It's not about us. It's about him. And when we use the Bible to seek him out, to fall in love with him and, and to get to know as much about Jesus, as much about our king as possible, then he changes us. And we're not looking for how he's going to change us. He changes us. It's a natural, it's a natural um, result of following him, of finding him. And so dispensations helps us in that because it helps us to see what God is doing throughout history and how he deals with man throughout history. And so I can't remember the exact quote um, from Spencer Smith, but he, he said it in a really cool way. And so he said that dispensations are like God turning the page and providing new information for the next part of his story. And so as we look at dispensations, it's like God is turning the page and he's showing new information. He's introducing new information. He is he is taking man and he's showing man more of himself. And so we're going to look through dispensations and real quickly here, you know, we see there's innocence that's from creation here, um, conscience, human government, and really human government goes from after the flood straight through to Jesus's kingdom. Then there's the promise, law, grace, tribulation, and the kingdom. So we're gonna we're gonna unpack that. But one thing very understand this this is something that's very important to understand, and this right here will counter um, some false doctrine immediately, because there's a false doctrine right now in a lot of the Word of Faith, NAR, um, those those kinds of of um, a false teaching that says that the church is going to in the world and this is new age that's why because it's you know word of faith and and nar is basically just new age but you put christianity words in it and so what they say is that everything's going to get better that the church is going to conquer the seven mountains of human influence and and it's going to usher in this golden age it's it's exactly what the new age says too, that it's going to usher in the, this golden age. And then Jesus will return when the church does that. Now that of course is not biblical whatsoever. Nowhere in the Bible does it say anything remotely like that. It says the opposite in the Bible. Not only this dispensation ends in failure of man, but every dispensation, there's a pattern that they end in disaster. And that's on purpose because every dispensation proves that man can't do it. That God himself is the one that does it. That man doesn't. We're not supposed to. God is the one that comes in and rescues. So a dispensation refers to that specific, to a specific period of time in which God deals with humanity in a unique way. So in each dispensation, we see that man ends up failing and God steps in to save man and to restore man's relationship to himself, relationship to God. So any ism and dispensationalism is no different, can be taken to one extreme or another. So we're looking, dispensation is in the Bible, <laughs> you know, the words are in the Bible, and we're looking at this just fact. Of, of the way the Bible is laid out. Now, dispensationalism can be taken to extremes. Um, and that's with any biblical concept, man gets their hands on it and tries to uh, stretch it and tries to make whole theologies out of it, which um, can, be, can be troubling. So, but this does help us to understand where we are right now and it helps us to understand what portions of the Bible are written specifically to us. And this is very important 
Because remember, all the Bible is for us. Remember, every bit of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is profitable for us. It's for us to read. It's for us to understand. It's for us to understand God as a result of it. Um, because it's all about understanding him. But it isn't always, but not all the Bible is to us and not all the Bible is about us. And so the Bible, there, the majority of the Bible is written to the people of Israel and is specifically tied to the land of Israel. And we should not take promises that were written specifically to Israel and specifically regarding the land of Israel and apply them however we see fit. That's taking things out of context. And that is to our detriment. We are not to do that. Um, so it's important for us to understand dispensations. It's important for us to understand and read the Bible in its context instead of, um, instead of, you know, having this kind of soundbite theology where, where we look at things and we see this verse and we really like it. So we want to apply it to our lives and we take it out of context and we miss the whole point of what God's doing. So the first dispensation is this dispensation of innocence. So God created Adam and Eve perfect. He created them absolutely perfect. And they had a perfect relationship with God. They knew God and he gave them one law, one law. And this is actually an example. It may be kind of a silly example, but this is an example of us understanding that this is for us to understand, but it's not to us. This is not a law that still applies to us. We, there is not a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we are not supposed to eat from. It's been removed. So that's an example to where you, I mean, that's kind of a, a duh example, but we take other things that should be a duh example too. So, but he gave them one law. He said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, you can eat from anything else, but that tree in the midst of the garden, do not, eat, do not eat it. And what that meant is, trust me, trust me. They failed to trust God. Instead, they trusted Lucifer. They trusted Satan's promise of being like God. And as a result of that, sin and death entered into creation. And so it, not just man fell, but all of creation fell because of their choice. And their choice was they put their trust in Satan rather than trusting God. And so God removed them from Eden. He removed them from the garden because he didn't want them to stay and eat of the tree of life after doing that and remaining in a fallen state forever. It was his mercy that he removed them. So that ended the age of innocence. The age of, in of innocence ended in disaster. Here are people that had never known sin, never known um, separation from God were now separated from him because man trusted Lucifer. They trusted Satan rather than trusting God, but God made a way and he made a promise of a Messiah that would come from woman, from the seed of woman. Right there was the promise of the virgin birth right from the very start and that he would restore mankind to God. So that brings us to the next dispensation. So God turns the page from innocence to consciousness, the knowledge of good and evil, this pre-flood time. So Adam and Eve's offspring populated the entire world. And the entire world came from those two. And after 1,650 years, man had been polluted physically and spiritually. Now remember, God said it's going to be the seed of woman that's going to bring the messiah that's going to bring the answer that's going to restore relationship and so what did satan do he went after women we see in genesis 6 that the elohim this the sons of god the the um fallen angels polluted the gene pool 
They polluted the DNA. And as a result of that, God brought the flood. He chose one man and he brought the flood or the eight, one man's line. He brought the flood and he ended the pre-flood age with disaster. The world had been populated with evil, with sin, and he brought disaster. So the next dispensation ended in disaster and the age of innocence um, the age of the age of conscience ended in disaster because man trusted in self and Satan rather than God. In such a short period of time, they they had even a couple generations from actually hearing the story firsthand from Adam, and they had fallen away. But God preserved mankind through Noah, who was intact in his generations. He was intact in his generations. He did not have that Nephilim DNA, he did not have that, um, that DNA in him. And so there's a new age would come and the promise would be secure because of Noah and his line that God would continue and he would have that promise. And so the next dispensation was human government. Until, and this is until the Tower of Babel. So Noah's three sons multiplied. And again, you know, you have eight people multiplying to a great magnitude, again, in a short period of time. And, you know, in a, a somewhat short period of time. So Noah's three sons multiplied and became a great multitude. Nimrod, Noah's great grandson, formed man's first world empire. This is Babel. And we've talked a lot about this. This is Babylon. This is the, this right here is the beginning of Babylon that we see in Revelation. It never went anywhere. Remember here, here at Babel, and we talked about this before, we had Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. We had the unholy trinity. And so right from the beginning, Satan planted, this is the beginning, not only of human government, but of the false gods. This is the beginning of false worship and of worship of man rather than worship of God. So right, right away from this time, you had Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, you had the um, mother the um, you know worshiping of of the woman and the child all comes from this time period. So this is not only the beginning of human government, but also the beginning of the harlot. So this is very important because human government and the harlot have been married ever since, and that's why you see mystery Babylon in Revelation, and it's all the same thing. You know, when God confused the language and he scattered Babylon, they took this false trinity across the entire world. They took Zeus. They took the mother, you know, the um, this um, um, mother worship, this female worship, divine uh, worship of man, worship of kings. They took that all around the world, the same basic uh, false worship. And it's still going on today. You see it in the Catholic church today. And, and not just the Catholic church, it's, it's all over the place. And so the same thing. So here we have Nimrod, Noah's great grandson formed the first world empire, but he turned the hearts of men away from God. And he built the Tower of Babel, to defy God and prevent him from being able to stop them through a flood again. So the tower was one thing for everybody to be together, government and worship together, but also it was so they could escape judgment from God again. So human government would continue, the spots worship would also continue, but God stopped the unity of this first empire by confusing their language. And today, we see that reversed. We see them literally trying to copy the Babylon symbol, you know, the, the, the building even with the EU parliament building. 
Um, and they even boast how it's many tongues, but one language, how they, everything comes back together now. And because of AI, because of the way the world has gotten so small and connected, now we've got the unity that we couldn't have had any other time. And so you see how it all comes back in fault, but um, I'm, I'm getting off of the dispensations, so, but you can see how this, how this is progressing. So the first human government ended in disaster. Again, every dispensation, this one included, ends in disaster because man trusted himself and rejected God. But God would choose a man and he would build a nation. And on that promise of Messiah and his messianic kingdom would come. And so that brings us to the next dispensation, which is the dispensation of promise. So God chose Abraham. He brought Abraham out of paganism. He chose Abraham and he made a covenant with Abraham, giving him the promise of a land, a great nation and the coming Messiah. And so God would work through 12 tribes of Israel to build a people for himself. So God brought Israel out of Egypt, out of the world. But Israel refused to enter the promised land, and that resulted in 40 years in the wilderness, where all those over 20 would die. And so I, I want to underline one thing here. Here, you know, God made this promise to Abraham. So this is from Abraham to Moses. God chose Abraham. Now, today we have Abrahamic family house. It's Abraham, but it's everybody underneath Abraham. It's the harlot, there's a Catholic church, and then there's a mosque. But that's not what God said. He chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the 12 tribes of Jacob, that is Israel. He, turned, he changed Jacob's name to Israel. That is what God chose. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Abrahamic family house, is blasphemy. That's not what he chose. Um, the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic courts. No, that's wrong. That's a slap in the face to what God did. And so you see how there's nothing new under the sun. We still have Babylon and we have the lie where the enemy tries to counterfeit what God has done. The enemy tried to counterfeit what God said with that, the answer, the Messiah would come from the seed of woman. So right away, the enemy tried to counterfeit the virgin birth before the virgin birth even happened because he knew what God had promised. See, the enemy knows our God better than we do, which is the problem. We need to know our Bible so well that we don't fall for the enemy's counterfeits, that we don't fall for Abrahamic family house and we don't fall for the Abraham Accords because we know immediately when we hear those things that that is wrong. So God worked through these 12 tribes to build a people for himself and he brought them to the promised land and of course there were those 40 years that they had to stay in the wilderness and the and the um the men of war, the, those over 20 died in the wilderness and it was their children that were able to go into the promised land. And so we see this pattern here that through those 40 years, there was a time of judgment, but it was also a time of preparation because God used that time to teach them who he is. He brought them out of Egypt in a short period of time. But it took 40 years for him to bring to get it to get the Egypt out of them. So the age of promise ended in disaster because Israel chose fear of man over trusting God. They were afraid to go into the promised land because they were afraid of the giants. They didn't trust God. But God would choose, would use those 40 years to teach Israel how to serve him how to prepare their children to enter into the promised land. So God takes the disaster and he works it to good. So that brings us to 
the time of the law, the dispensation of law. And this is from Moses to Jesus. Israel was given the law to reveal God's character and to point to Jesus. And so I, this is so beautiful right here. As you see the way that God had them, God gave them the pattern of the cross in the wilderness. And we're going to see this in a little bit later too, another way that he did this. But he gave them the pattern of the cross in the wilderness with the way that the camps laid out. And I was reading, I think it was two nights ago, I was reading um, about the different um, the different groupings here. Because here are these four, the 12 tribes were were out, but each each of these had had three um had three of the tribes that were made up and and so it was the the standard for each of these had an image so the standard for one and I should have written this down because I'm afraid I'm going to say it wrong but like the standard for Judah and Judah was one of them and so the the standard for the one with Judah was of course the lion the standard for Ephraim was, um, I think it was a man. I may be getting them mixed up. The standard for, I think it was Simeon. Uh, I may be getting them mixed up, but there's, there's four of them and each one had a standard. So it had the lion, a man, it had an eagle and it had a, a wolf. And so each of these, we see the standards and they're the same images that you see on the living creatures that are around God and his throne. And so I just thought that was so amazing because I've never noticed that before. But God had this beautiful picture of heaven with here his presence, the, the tabernacle being this copy and shadow of what's in heaven. And he even had the tribes laid out like the four living creatures that are around the throne. How amazing is that? God is just so intricate and he's so beautiful and he wants his people to know him, him. The enemy wants us to look at God's word and try to say, how can I apply this to myself? No, God wants us to know him. It's just so awesome. Okay, so when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law. So here, Israel was given the law to reveal God's character and point to Jesus. When Jesus came, he fulfilled the law. He kept every bit of the law. He didn't come to do away with the law. He came to interpret it correctly. He came to show that it was always about him. It was always pointing to him as the perfect sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath and to restore mankind, mankind's relationship to God. Israel rejected their promised Messiah. And as a result, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and they were scattered not to return until this final generation, all of them returning again, 1948. And so they're returning again at this final generation. So 40 Jubilees passed. They rejected the promised land 40 years passed. They rejected the promised Messiah and 40 Jubilees passed. So the age of law ended in disaster because Israel rejected God. They rejected God himself, the Messiah. But God would use the next 40 Jubilees to save countless men and women, to save countless people and to build the bride of Jesus. And so God turns all these things to his glory and for his purpose. And so here, this brings us to the, um, the dispensation that we're part of right now, the dispensation of grace. And this is from Pentecost, Acts 2, to the rapture. Jesus, with Jesus' sacrifice, the church began. The Holy Spirit now indwells us. We literally have God in us. We are not God. We are not little God. God is literally indwelling us. Salvation is available for everyone who will put their trust in Jesus alone. 
salvation has, has been provided and is easy and is simple. The enemy tries to complicate it. The enemy tries to, to make you think you've got to jump through hoops, which makes you not trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus and what he did alone. That is salvation. And that is the greatest miracle ever. So the enemy wants to discredit the greatest miracle, which is salvation. He wants to make that seem like it's cheap or it's not much of anything or it's not really a miracle. The greatest miracle ever is that man can be restored to God in what Jesus did and what he did alone. As this current dispensation ends, we see how once again, man is failing to trust God over Satan self and influences when we see that we see our world the more we see the bible in technicolor all around us the more we see the bible proven over and over again the more we see israel and and everything that god said would happen happening before us the more we see this world trusting satan rather than trusting god the more we see this world scrambling for a man to answer their problems. The more we see the world scrambling for self, the more we see the world scrambling for drugs and some way to numb themselves and some way to escape. So we see that this dispensation is hopeless and that's by design because it's not man that does it. It's Jesus that does it. And so the church one day soon will be escaped. The church will be raptured out of the world in a rescue mission, just as sudden destruction comes. So the age of grace, the church age will end in disaster because man continues to reject God and continues to trust in self or others above God's word. God's word is the Bible. God's word is not anything else but the Bible. But God will take his precious bride out and he's going to finish what he promised to Israel. And that's what we see right now. We see the church age closing and we see God's attention turning to his people. We see Israel being positioned to seek him and receive him. And so we see all of that ready to go. We see Babylon. Coming back in focus again, too, we see all these players coming in focus for the final act. And so the next dispensation that we see coming very quickly, um, God will finish the 70 weeks that he decreed to Israel. He is going to finish the 70 weeks of Daniel. He's going to finish the tribulation. He's going to finish Jacob's trouble. There is one week left in which sin and rebellion will be dealt with. And Israel and God, and, and with that, God is going to restore Israel to himself. So this time is also referred to as Jacob's trouble. Satan, his fallen angels, the demons, and those who follow them will be defeated at the end of this final seven. So the bad guys right now that are driving us crazy, that are doing horrible things with kids, that are doing all those horrible things that you hear about, that you just want to see them get theirs. They have a very short period of time left. They will be dealt with. Nobody gets away with what they're doing. No one gets away with anything. They will all be defeated by God at the end of seven. And it's when God's full wrath is poured out on those rejecting him and persecuting his people. And so he, you know, when Jesus comes back, he says he, he separates the sheep from the goats. And what does he do? He separates them according to how they treated Israel. This is something that a lot of people do not understand. God is very concerned with how people treat his people and his nation, Israel. And there's so much anti-Semitism and there's so much replacement theology and which is just from the pit of hell, people that hate Israel. And, and they use the Bible. They twist the Bible. Honestly, if you read, 
if you have problems with this, if you hate the nation of Israel, most likely you wouldn't have listened to this straight through if you hate Israel. But if you hate Israel, if you're going to put nasty comments in, in my things, I challenge you to read Genesis through Revelation in quick succession. Just read the Bible. Don't go to your different YouTube people and, and take soundbite theology and take a verse here and a verse there and try to twist it to your will. Read Genesis to Revelation. Now you want immediately to get an immediate answer, read Revelation, read, read Romans 11, but read Genesis to Revelation in quick succession. You can, you can literally read it. If you're serious, you can read it in 30 days. I have. You can read it in 90 days. Get it read. Read the entire Bible. And then see if you can still have replacement theology, because you can't. Not if you read it quickly. Not if you're serious. You will see what God says. It's very, very clear. He's, he's not, he doesn't play. It's very, very obvious if you actually read the entire Bible. So the age of tribulation is disaster. The entire tribulation period is disaster. It's not meant for the church. We're not here. The age of tribulation is the worst time on hum of human history. That's what Jesus said. It's going to end in the near destruction of all flesh on earth. Jesus says if he does not come back early, if he does not come back early, no flesh would be saved. And all those who trust in the Antichrist will be destroyed. But Jesus returns just in time to save all of Israel remaining and to set up his kingdom on earth. And so there will be, there'll be Israel, all of Israel, when he returns, will go into the millennial kingdom. And there will be believers all across the planet that have somehow survived the tribulation period that will go into the millennial kingdom and will repopulate the millennial kingdom. And so that brings us to the millennial kingdom. And so, so here, this, this will be amazing. This is, this is a wonderful, wonderful dispensation that we get to also be a part of. So Jesus with us, with us in hand, will return and physically reign on earth for a thousand years. The earth will be healed from Jerusalem. And you can read how that will happen in Ezekiel 47, that, that living water is how God heals the planet. It's so, so amazing. So Israel will take her rightful place in her land and serve King Jesus during this time. Life will be expanded and those who survive the tribulation will have children and they will repopulate the world. This will be the perfect government, perfect King Jesus. they will be, Jesus is going to literally rule and reign with us too for a thousand years many will still reject him though and this this is where you see that even when man has the perfect they have there's no excuse that jesus is their king many will steal and satan is in a bottomless pit he, he's he's in the abyss during this too so they don't have satan messing with them but um the flesh the flesh will still be here. And so many people are still going to reject him. At the end of a thousand years, Satan is released for a very short period of time. And in that period of time, he is going to amass a huge army to come against Jerusalem. And they're going to quickly, quickly be defeated. And then judgment on all the lost will occur in the great white throne judgment. And so you know, I think the reason that God does this is because he allows man to make that choice. And he allows them to make their own case against themselves. He allows them, just like he's allowing right now, he's allowing the entire world to show and to prove that it's time for judgment because he's allowing the entire world to just show how, how reprobate they are. And to make this case against themselves. And this is what he'll do. He'll bring them all together for judgment. He'll bring them all together against himself, against his people, and he'll defeat them. And then the Bible says that everything goes away except for this great right, white throne judgment. And all the dead are judged at that time. And so that's all of those 
who did not receive Jesus are judged at the great white, white throne judgment. So that's not us. We, of course, are ruling and reigning with him. Remember, if you, if you are born twice, if you're born again, you're born twice. If you're born twice, you only die once or you don't die at all if you're after. I'm, I'm hoping no, no death here. If you are only born once, you die twice. If you're not born again, you die twice. And the great white throne judgment is the second death. So even the millennial kingdom is going to end in disaster for those who reject Jesus. Heaven and earth are going to be refined by fire that burns away all the corruption. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where there's no corruption. God will then bring in the, the new heaven and new earth. This is the, the last dispensation that we know of. This is eternity, eternity future. And so a new heaven and a new earth and this curse, the curse is completely gone. All mankind is in Jesus. All mankind is, is regenerated. All mankind is, is perfect. All corruption is gone. All sin is gone. All death is gone. Man will be perfect living in perfect union, unity with God. There'll be no need for a temple because Jesus is right there. There's no need for anything to come between. There's no need for anything to purify. There'll be no need for a son because God, Jesus is the light and he's going to be right in our midst. God, the father is going to be right in our midst. The full Trinity is going to be right in our midst. There'll be no, no need for separation. And so salvation in every dispensation, salvation has been by grace. And so this is important to understand. Every dispensation is a, is a page turning and God revealing himself to mankind. But it's always been by grace. God desires our trust. And that's what he wants. He wants our trust. He doesn't want our work. He wants our trust. Works as a natural outflow. He is always graceful. Salvation is always an act of grace. It's always unmerited favor. And we see this. Um, Romans 4, 2 through 4. Abraham was indeed justified by works. He had something, if Abraham was indeed justified by works, he would have had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was his trust in God that made him righteous. Now the wages of the worker are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. And so it is our belief that credits us righteousness. Romans 4, 23 through 24. Now the words, it was credited to him were written not only for Abraham, but also for us to whom righteousness will be credited. For us who believe in him who was raised, Jesus our Lord from the dead. John three fourteen. just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, see all these types and shadows. See, just as Moses lifted up here, this was made sin, the snake. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. It's just putting your trust in him. You know, the people had to believe when they looked, they had to believe to look toward the snake. Everybody that looked toward the snake, regardless of where they were in the camp, regardless if they were right up on the snake or not, everyone that looked received the healing. We look to him, we put our trust in him and we have eternal life. Um, Galatians 5, 21, for he has made him sin who knew no sin i'm sorry corinthians i can't see it who knew no sin that we might be the righteousness of god in him and so here we are accredited that righteousness because of because of his grace because of trusting in him this age will end in disaster we know that from god's word we see the disaster quickly approaching us all around us. Jesus described these days as birth pains and he instructed us to look up 
as we see them begin. And so we're definitely seeing them begin. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to look up. And that means that our focus is on him. Our focus isn't on all the craziness. We're watching, but our focus isn't on the craziness. Our focus is on him. Just as an expectant mom can have joy in the midst of the pain because she knows it will accomplish birth, we too can be expectant and joyful seeing the day approaching. We don't have to be like those around us who have no hope. We see that this pain is gonna accomplish a birth, but it still hurts. It hurts really bad. And we need to be measured and mourn with those who mourn. The world is entering the worst time it will ever see. We've got to remember that. That and, and we talked about this before. You know, when you walk around in a store, um, when you're driving about, about your, your daily business, the majority of the people that you pass are lost. And if they died today, they would go to hell. And if the rapture happened right now, they would still be here. We, we need to keep that on the forefront of our mind. That's our purpose. We want to help as many as possible escape this coming tribulation. And so the final thought is explaining away the rapture. You know, soon millions of people all over the planet are going to disappear. And we already see the world preparing for that. And we see how quickly the world will believe a scenario. We see how quickly the world just copes and goes on to the next thing. The common thread will be that they were all Christians that disappear. This is going to be difficult to explain or hide away, but the enemy's been working on his spin for a long time. You know, think about it. He, he had been working on counterfeiting the virgin birth. He'd been working first trying to infiltrate with the Nephilim but he had been working on that for thousands of years before Jesus came. He has been working on his spin of the rapture. Satan has been shipping away at the narrative for generations. It started with evolution back in the 1850s. Roswell UFO incident in 1947, right before Israel came a nation. Project Bluebeam began in the mid-1990s. When the rapture happens, the enemy will have his story ready and the media, Hollywood, world governments will back it. And anyone who questions will be canceled. Um, you guys remember not too long ago at all, <laughs> we love, um, we love like the, uh, the superhero kind of movies and stuff like that. And, and, um, and so in game, you know, here you have the Marvel, all the Marvel superheroes, the in game movies. Watching the movie, it didn't even hit me at first. There was a rapture type in the movie. When Thanos snapped his fingers, more than what will be raptured, unfortunately, half the planet disappeared. There was a rapture right there. People have been programmed. When we're gone, and, and think about this, Thanos was the bad guy that took away half the people. And who these, these aliens, these superhuman lying wonders <laughs> were the heroes. And that's exactly what's going to happen during the tribulation. All these people are going to be gone and people are going to be freaking out and they're going to be mad. And there's going to be these lying wonders and literal demons in you know, a revelation. It talks about there will be supernatural things happening. And so the world has been, has, has been given images of what's going to happen. We've been programmed. People have been given some narratives already. And so anyone that has an actual biblical narrative is going to be canceled, is going to be mocked, is going to be murdered. 
going to be decapitated is what the Bible says is what's going to happen to those who are left behind and find truth. They will not be tolerated. So the videos, the resources on the Bible and the rapture that, that we're sharing right now with people, the stuff that we have in our homes, um, the stuff online, they're going to, it's going to begin to disappear off the internet. So today we can, we see how easy this can happen. We already see there's, um, there's, you know, fact checkers that come in and it's whatever, whatever the government says is the reality, which is what's happening. And, and so already we see how truth can be removed and it can also be polluted because there's so much false information. It's hard to even know what's true right now. And when we see what AI can do, it, it they can, they can, they completely can, can fabricate everything. They can take a dead person and completely bring them back in a video. It, it, we won't be able to believe your eyes anymore. So today we can see how easy this can happen. The enemy will have a well-prepared counter and he'll have a great deception. And God even says that he will give people over to the lie because they rejected the truth. God will give them over to their desire to believe a lie. So what do we do? Now is the time for us to warn people. Now is the time for us to plant seeds and we hope that they will receive Jesus before we're gone. But if not, maybe what we say will ring true, true and maybe they'll be part of that multitude. There's gonna be an amazing revival, worldwide revival. It's after we're gone. But there's gonna be this incredible revival, biblical revival that happens during the tribulation period. And somebody that we talked to today could be one of those. It could be a seed that we plant. It could be a left behind letter that we left. It could be a book. It could we be a Bible that we leave behind that makes all the difference in the world. So our job is to point people to Jesus and to remind them that what they're seeing is not normal and that Jesus is coming back. That's her job. All right. Well, that is between two dispensations. And I hope you guys are encouraged that we, we're, we're going to see Jesus. And what we see right now is the Bible. And so get in the Bible. Um, read the Bible as much as you can. Try to see how many times. And I hope it's not many. I hope, it's, I hope we don't get through the Bible again before he comes and gets us. But try that. That's a challenge. If, you, if you're not reading the Bible right now, start in Genesis, get on a Bible plan and try to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and see if you can read it as fast as you can. See if you can get it in before we go home. That's what, that's been my purpose in the last four years. And I, I did not think I would be able to read it as many times. As I have. Mm -hmm. And I really hope I don't finish it again <laughs> before he brings me home. But that, I think that's a great goal to have. Try to read it as many times as you can. So um, thank you guys and God bless you. And um, hopefully we'll see each other in the clouds.